So can we really learn about emerging trends in science and technology and their socially responsible, ethical and beneficial use all by watching a few science fiction movies? The answer, of course, is yes, we can. This is exactly what we do in this course. But to understand how and why, we need to step back and take a bigger perspective on the nature of science, technology, society and the future. So we're sitting here at a unique point in human history. It's a point in human history where we're at a tipping point between what we can do in science and technology, the consequences that occur from that and how that impacts the future we're facing. And this is a tipping point which is dominated by a number of things that we just haven't seen before in the last 10,000 or so years. The first is this idea of coupling. And here I specifically mean the coupling between what we can do and the environment we live in. In other words, how our technologies, how our actions impact on our environment and how that in turn impacts on us. This is an incredibly tight coupling we have now so that everything we do resonates the around the world and in impacts the environment we live in in ways that have been unprecedented for the past 10,000 years of human history. That is a game changer. But it's not the only game changer. The second one is control. And by that, I mean the ways in which we can control at an incredibly fundamental level everything around us. So we know this in the digital sphere. So if you look at cyber, this is a domain that we've actually created, we've invented from scratch as humans. And we know instinctively that if we can have control over the ones and the zeros, the base code of this domain, we can effectively manipulate and control that domain. And we're doing that with increasing sophistication. But it's not the only domain that we have control in. You look at biology. Over the last 20 years, we've learned to not only read genetic sequences and whole genomes, but we've also learned to write new sequences. And we've learned to code them with incredible precision. In other words, we now have control, even though it's basic control, over the fundamental code that determines or certainly affects every living organism on this planet. And as a result, we can actually seriously begin to think about changing the nature of organisms, re-editing, redesigning biology. That is an incredible level of control we have, but it comes with incredible responsibility. We can do the same thing actually with the physical stuff around us as well. So you take something like this pen and you look at the materials that it's made of. Those materials ultimately come down to the atoms and molecules that make them up. And how the material behaves, what it does, what it looks like, what it feels like, is all down to the arrangement of those atoms. If you can control that arrangement, you can control the material. And effectively, this is the same as digital coding, but it's with atoms and molecules. We can now actually code physical reality. We do this through technologies like nanotechnology. So you begin to think about this. We have unprecedented control over the world we inhabit, even ourselves, even our biology. And that, in turn, means that we've got incredible control over the future. But the question is, do we know how to use this control? Or are we going to brick the future simply because we don't know what we're doing? And then the third thing here, which really defines this nexus, is the idea of communication. We live in an incredible age of communication. Ideas can circle the world at the speed of light. Information can circle the world at the same speed. Misinformation can as well. And as a result, we're having to grapple with the fact that so much information, so much communication, and so much miscommunication is circling around, and we need to understand how that impacts on not only society, but also how we begin to think about the future and how we work together to build that future. So these three things together, coupling, control, communication, put us at a tipping point in human history. And it's a tipping point where where we've got to think radically differently about how we build the future if we're going to thrive and survive in this future. The trouble is, we don't really have many good ways of doing this. If you look at how we're conventionally taught, how we're conventionally educated, it actually creates problems. So conventional thinking in this nexus leads to stress in the system. It leads us to us making false steps. So we may think we're doing a great thing with our technology, but actually it's going to lead us into a really dark place. And ultimately, it leads to fragility. In other words, if we're actually going to build the future we aspire to, we've got to start thinking differently. And we need to do this because this is a complex nexus of vulnerabilities. In other words, there are pitfalls there that we could easily fall into, tipping points so we get things slightly wrong and the whole future changes. 
and highly unconventional risks. In other words, we have enormous challenge in front of us and a challenge that we simply can't address through conventional ways of thinking, conventional skills and conventional training. We also know, and that, so that, that's a big statement, but we know something about why this is happening and how it's happening. And we know that because we've had 10,000 years of history around problem solving. And that history has taught us that the vast majority of today's social, environmental and economic challenges are a direct result of past innovation. So we know that it's easy to get innovation wrong. In fact, we've got 10,000 years of history of getting it wrong. And so we also know that if we're not careful, we're going to carry on doing that in the future. It's just that stakes are higher than ever now. Now, that may sound like a scary statement. It's actually not all that bad, but this is where it comes from. As a, as a species, we've got incredibly good at problem solving. So over the last 10,000 years, this is pretty much what we've done. We've faced problems, we've innovated, we've come up with solutions. The world has been a better place apart from the fact that every solution we've come up with as a species has ended up with consequences, and those consequences have led to the next generation of problems. So we go around this cycle of problem innovation, solution, consequences, next problem. Now, that is problematic in itself. It's actually not as big a deal as it might seem, because as long as the solutions outstrip the problems, in other words, as long as we solve problems faster than we create them, we can make some sort of progress. And so some people would argue that over the last 10,000 years, we've seen this steady progress, however you want to define that, in human society and in the world we live in. So this has been an era where the time scale of the consequences of our actions has been significantly larger than the time scale it takes to innovate our way out of problems. So think about that. Every time we do something, there are consequences, but we've been able to innovate so fast that we've been able to get to the next set of solutions before those consequences really bite. So this has been an era that's been dominated by negative feedback loops. In other words, we've been able to damp down the adverse consequences of innovation. It's been an era where there have been relatively intuitive and linear associations between cause and effect. So it's been fairly easy to see what the consequences of our actions are. And as a result of that, relatively simple innovation models have applied. And we've been able to get away with trial and error. In other words, we have a problem, we try something, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. If it doesn't work, we've got enough time to go back to the drawing board and try again. But what happens when the time scale of consequences becomes smaller than the time scale of innovation? In other words, no matter how fast we innovate, the consequences of our innovation are always swamping us. This, if it occurs, is a real problem. This would be an era of positive feedback loops. And by that, I mean no matter how hard we try and innovate our way out of problems, the solutions will always arrive too late. Not only that, the solutions will actually flip if we're not careful and become even bigger problems. So no matter how hard we try, we might end up making the matter worse and making the world a worse place. As a result of that, this would be an era of complex or nonlinear associations between cause and effect. In other words, we can't just use old models and say we understand if you do something, these are the consequences, because now we live in a world where you do something here and consequences pop up somewhere else. So we need to take this complex perspective, there's this complex systems perspective of what's happening. And because of this, simple innovation models simply do not apply if we're living in this era. We can't use simple conventional thinking to try and build a better future. And because of that, we need highly unconventional thinking. This, if it existed, would be an era where the way that we've been training people to think, the way we've been giving them particular skills around innovation and future building simply would not work. The problem is, we're already at this tipping point. We're already moving into a future where the consequences or the time scale of the consequences of our actions is actually smaller than the time scale that it takes for us to innovate out of them. One of the most obvious examples of this is climate change. So of course, climate change occurs over a long period of time. But it also takes us a long time to innovate out of the problems that we're causing. And of course, climate change, human-driven climate change, is a very in-your-face set of consequences of our actions. And we're beginning to see now just how difficult it is to innovate our way out of a set of problems, even though those problems are staring us in the face at a planetary level. 
But climate change is just one example of a number of areas where we're at a tipping point within the planet we live on, where the consequences of our actions are pushing us over a boundary faster than we can innovate ourselves away from them. So these tipping points or these boundaries come from the Stockholm Resilience Center. And you can begin to see everywhere from biogeochemical flow, so that's specifically looking at the chemicals we use in fertilizers, to biosphere integrity, and including biodiversity, we are losing the battle here. The consequences of our actions are happening far faster than we can innovate out of them. We're also seeing this with a number of cutting edge emerging technologies where the things that we can do and what we're doing with those technologies are far outstripping our understanding of the consequences. This is just one example where a number of I'm guessing well-meaning people, although maybe that's being generous, are thinking that maybe we can use artificial intelligence and machine learning to predict when somebody is a criminal or not. In other words, you'd see a picture of a couple of people. Computers, they say, should be able to tell which one's the criminal and which one's not. And we're actually beginning to experiment with systems like this now. The trouble is these systems have very human biases built in. So they, in some cases, decide who's a criminal and who's not, not based on what these people can do, not surprisingly because you just can't actually do this, but because of the racial biases and other biases that are built into the algorithms. In other words, we're trying to fix a problem, but we're actually making the problem even worse as we do so. And we're seeing this in many, many different places. Another example is looking at gene editing. So we can do incredible things with DNA these days. We can effectively do a search and replace function on genetic sequences. So you take something like the human genome. We can send molecules down that, that human genome to look for a very specific sequence of DNA, and they can snip it out, and they can replace it with something else. This is CRISPR gene editing. There are other forms of this coming out. An incredible technology. And it's a technology that is actually meaning that we can cut the ties with our evolutionary past, and we can actually start determining our own biological future, if we could get it right. The trouble is we don't know how to get it right yet, we just know how to do it. And this became very apparent a couple of years ago in China when a Chinese scientist decided he was going to use this particular technique on embryos. So he took a, a couple of human embryos and he gene edited them supposedly to make them resistant to the HIV virus. Um, an incredible step because he was messing around with their genetic sequences and their base human genome. There was a massive backlash around the world um, around this because scientists thought this was just overstepping an ethical boundary. But it happened, and it happened because our ability to do stuff is far outstripping our ability to understand how to do it wisely and smartly. Interestingly, even though there was this backlash around the world against this one particular scientist, it didn't stop other scientists. So shortly after that, there were reports of a Russian scientist trying to do exactly the same thing. And here's the problem. Because we can do something, there's always going to be somebody that tries to do it and doesn't think about the consequences. And that might be fine if we can somehow damp down the consequences of our actions. But when we live in a world with tight coupling and with super fast communication, the chances are we're going to have positive feedback loops where we end up doing an awful lot of damage that we can't pull back from just because somebody had a good idea. Another example of this is self-driving cars, autonomous vehicles, where we're seeing very rapid advances and developments in what we can do with cars that drive themselves. And this is a great idea. Humans really shouldn't be behind the wheel in cars. These are death machines. If we could get a super smart computer to do that, the world would be a safer place. But there are problems, and this came to light a few years ago here in Tempe, Arizona, where we had the first death from somebody being hit by a self-driving vehicle. And it just demonstrated that there is a chasm between what we can do with technology and how we do it safely and smartly. This isn't to say that self-driving vehicles are a bad idea. They're an incredibly good idea. But we have to work out how to do this safely and responsibly and ethically. And the trouble is, we can do it at the moment, but we haven't got the boundaries in place or the systems in place that help us actually navigate how to do this well. So these are challenges that aren't just directly connected to the technologies and the specific science and technologies we develop. There are also very deep social dimensions here. 
So some of you may have seen the documentary The Social Dilemma. Um, this was a documentary that shook a lot of people up because it looks at the insidious impact of social media on people's lives. And it demonstrated how, and I, it, it's an interesting, it's a good documentary, but it does push things in some cases a little further than maybe they're warranted. But it highlighted the reality that we have these technological platforms, social media, which in some ways seem fairly benign, and yet they're affecting people's lives to such an extent that they're becoming as harmful in some cases as an addictive drug or even worse. And then the question is, just because we can do this, how do we know how to do it safely and well? How do we navigate this brand new landscape that we're developing around technology and society? And this spills over into other areas as well. So another example, you look at social movements, the Black Lives Matter movement, for instance. What on earth is the connection between that and technology innovation? As it turns out, there's actually a really deep connection. And that connection is, just looking at this particular example, even the way we think about technology, even the words we use around technology, even the assumptions that we build into our technology reflect our own biases and our own myopic views. And as a result, we actually have racism built into the very technologies that we use. I'll give you one example. It's an example from uh, computing and control systems where we talk about master-slave systems. That may seem very innocuous, but it reflects the fact that we have a mindset that still thinks of masters and slaves. And that, in very subtle ways, affects the way that we actually develop technology, the way we deploy it, even the way we think about what is an acceptable technology versus an unacceptable technology. So these are all incredibly big challenges when it comes to thinking about technology in the future. But incredibly important, because if we get this wrong, again, coming back to this idea of coupling, the coupling is so tight between our actions and their responses and the reactions to them or the consequences of those, those actions that we risk making an incredible mess of the future. In many ways, it's a little bit analogous to the Middle Ages, where you have mariners going out on the high seas where they had no idea what they were going to expect on those high seas. They're going out into the unknown as, an, as a result you have maps like this, maps where they drew monsters on these seas because they had no idea what they were going to expect. So you have these here be monsters parts of the world back in the Middle Ages. Well, of course, here in the 21st century, we don't have real monsters, but we do have metaphorical monsters in the future that we face. And somehow we've got to work out how to build these maps of the future where there may be these metaphorical monsters. and We've got to work out how to navigate around them so we end up not getting in an, in an awful mess as we begin to approach that future. And this is absolutely a future where there are many, many more metaphorical monsters than there were a few decades ago. And this is reflected deeply in movies. So this gets us back to movies. So we have this landscape. We've got all of these problems. We know that unconventional thinking is needed. Conventional thinking, conventional training, conventional education doesn't work. We've got to think differently. How do we do this? And movies begin here to give us insights into ways of thinking, ways of doing that we may not otherwise see. And I just want to give you one example of this. This comes actually from one of the movies we're going to watch, Jurassic Park, where one of the characters, Ian Malcolm, says, and this is a really well-known um, quote, your scientists were so preoccupied with what they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. That is a message that is not only going to resonate all through this course, but it should resonate through everything you do at the moment. Because we live at a point in human history where this difference between what we can do and what we should do has profound consequences if we get it wrong. So in other words, as we look to the future, there are a number of things that are really important here. So... We live at this point in human history where there are stunning opportunities for what we can do. And I want to underline this. The technology that we're developing at the moment, the scientific knowledge, is amazing. It is awesome. It is awe-inspiring. It is incredible what we are potentially capable of doing as a species. And we can't afford to let go of that. But at the same time, we're looking at a future where because of the connections within society, because of the complex dynamics around society, technology in the future, because of the convergence between these technologies, and because of the fragility of the planet we live on, 
we're facing profound risks. Profound risks not only to the future of humanity, but for the future of ourselves and our self-identity if we don't get things right. And the only way we can navigate this, the only way we can make sense of this future map with metaphorical monsters and work out how to navigate around it, is by applying creativity and imagination. These are the ways in which we can see beyond our conventional training and understand the nature of the future landscape that we're facing. So how do we do this? How do we bring creativity and imagination into understanding how to develop new technologies socially, responsibly, and ethically? Well, the answer is, well, one answer out of many answers is through science fiction movies. And this is exactly what we do in this course, the Moviegoer's Guide to the Future. It's not the only way, but it's an incredibly powerful way. And it's powerful because movies are stories about our relationship with technology and the future, or the, the, the science fiction movies are. They're not necessarily about the technology or science, in fact, they usually get that wrong, but they have searing insights into how we are connected with the future and how we need to think about how our actions might lead to a worse future and how we can avoid those to build the future we aspire to. So this is exactly why we watch movies and we watch them in a particular way and why we use them as a catalyst for not only thinking differently about our relationship with the future and our responsibility to it, but looking at how we overcome some of the limitations of conventional thinking and conventional training so we can actually all become better, more effective, more responsible architects of that future.